Well, hi, Justin. Um, thank you very much for making the time to talk with me today. Um, and thank you very much for your witness statement, which was um, fabulous to read and helped me to understand. Um, I think when I first heard about you, I must have read something, I think, when you launched your book or something. I can't remember what it was, but um, I was very keen for us to reach out and have some contact with you. So I'm glad we're able to have this conversation today. So Yeah, it's great. Um, and so you're at Bernie, is it cold here today? Camp down in Bernie in my little bunker. Uh, yeah, it's sort of descending into the madness of a Bernie winter. Um, yeah. Actually, not the low temperatures that get you, it's the wind. Yeah, yeah. I must say, I was in Tasmania just before lockdown and um, I love it. We were hiking over there and in the Frasenay National Park and it was just beautiful. Oh, yeah. Wind even there, you start to feel it, don't you? Yeah, it's sort of it's something a bit, I don't know, as you age, there's something a bit existentially punishing about relentless wind. It's sort of a metaphor for something. But you wouldn't, I just, uh, it's good. There's, you forget that Bernie has these really blue sky, clear, warm, sunny winter days, which is sort of my favourite. Like the view over the sea is just incredible. And I'm sort of reconnecting with my spiritual roots. Yeah. Which, largely embodied in the burning sea, which mm. used to be a rust colour during the 1980s because pyroxide was pumping chemicals into it. But oh, yeah. I'm not here to, it's not a royal commission into the um, environmental no. practices of Tasmania. <laughs> but. No, well, thank you very much. And as I said, I read your witness statement with great interest. Um, and I think the journey you've been on is where I wanted to perhaps start. And then I really found some of your recommendations about what you think need to change incredibly helpful and so we'll come to that but are you happy if we start with your journey as a young and very young carer I guess is what you described about your early childhood and um, the early memories that you had I think you said from the age of six you knew something was not quite right with your mum so are you happy to start and give me a bit of a sense in terms of that? Yeah I suppose you understanding of what mental illness maybe is comes online at around six and seven and you're certainly not using those words you're just starting to remember your mum's strange behavior and she was obviously she had a lot of, a lot of aggro with nan and pop and you know it's sort of maybe fitting that the earliest memory of all is a fight between mum and nan and pop because that was a total running theme and it was a sunday afternoon um and you know, mum's dragging me towards the car and I don't want to go and I'm crying and Nan and Pop are upset. So that's, you know, it must be very odd for people to try and imagine that, but you're being, not wanting to go with your own mum back home in a mm. car on a Sunday afternoon at six. So I guess there's something instinctive about that. I obviously knew. Yes. It wasn't great, but you know, it's very common. Mum would drive whilst, you know, sick and angry she drive the car and um, I'm sure that wasn't ideal but that's just how we rolled and so and then at seven is probably the most poetically sort of dramatic one that even sort of floors me every time I think about it but I'm in bed at home with my Sesame Street book yes. and a red texter and mum's doing her loud sort of wailing crying in the room next to mine and I'm monitoring the volume levels with little spirals in yeah. the margins of my Sesame Street book. So I guess you could say at seven, I was, yeah, I was beginning my journey as a carer and I was just observing mum, which is most of my life has been generally just observing mum, yeah. trying to work out where she's at. So, um, we yeah, you know, and underestimate seven year olds, they've got a lot going on. Yeah. And I think that was what was so poignant is, you know, we've heard from so many carers, um, young carers and adult carers about the hypervigilance that they have to have, you know, that they are constantly hypervigilant, monitoring and worrying about the well-being of their loved one. And what you explained so poignantly was how early you started on that um, road of having to be mindful of where your mum's illness was at and what she what stage she was at and that vigilance about 
attending to and being aware of her needs and circumstances. So that was very, very poignant for me. Yeah, you go from like zero to leaping out of the beanbag, story mm. cut, straight into yeah. mum's room, think she started crying again. And, uh, you know, by the time I'm 12, I could walk home from school and knock on the front door and know if mum took a few seconds longer to open the door, I'd pretty much go, yeah, she's sick again. Yeah. Um, and if her hello on the phone was half a note off, I'd know in an instant maybe what the next three months entailed. So, yeah, it's a, I was certainly an ex, a world expert in a mum's illness by that point. But I think you also um, conveyed very strongly how, but what went on at home, you were encouraged to keep being something personal that was happening at home and so to the external world and at school you were presenting as a very high achieving focused young student so can you talk a little bit about how did you manage that it was pretty amazing i think living with someone with a mental illness is basically swapping between two universes and so a lot of my exhaustion as a person is just usually most people maybe all live in the one universe but mum lived in hers and I lived in mine and I was trying to cross over to hers and I guess in a way I had my double life I was a double agent at home being a carer and then at school where I was just a good little great little well-liked just about uh, was my nickname because I just about got there I came third a lot and <laughs> tried very hard and was on the SRC and um, to give you an idea like mum was well half the time and she was mother's help uh, at Montello Primary. So to talk about presenting well, you've got mum was actually in the classroom, you know, helping kids with their reading and I was at school, you know, being a good little student. And so, yeah, meanwhile, maybe, you know, a month later, I'd be back at home and there'd be sort of all hell breaking loose in the house. Um, so, you know, at, at mum's worst, I was just, I just trundled off to school the next day and school was basically what kept me going. But mm. kind of and amazing. I never really went off the rails and I never really told anybody what was going on. I just um, I had a very clear idea what my mission was in life and what the program was and I was extremely good at operating within that. So, Justin, you talked about the fact that when mum was well, she was really kind, warm and funny. That was the self that you knew when she was in a good state and when she was unwell, she was very different. But when she was unwell and you were a child at primary school, who did the day-to-day -day care for you? You know, the, were, was she able to still attend to all of your basic physical needs, getting your meals and all of those things together or did you have to do some of that yourself as well? I like to give mum a lot of credit because, um Boy, she tried hard for someone who, you know, she drove me crazy, like made me really mad and upset, like, why are you doing this? But she couldn't help it. And she had this sort of giant chaos inside her. And so she would make my breakfast and tea and make my bed and still do basic mum things most days. Yeah. And she just, yeah, she had this drive. She was such a great mother. and you know, with the mother craft nurse and yeah. very, very warm and caring and funny and kind, like one of the sweetest people I've ever met in my life. So this, she had this sort of incredibly sweet nature naturally and then this absolute sort of nuclear level of fury and chaos as an illness. So it mm. was such a dramatic, um, real, you know, you know, Jekyll and Hyde, two sides to her. And, uh, you know, at its worst, I think I had to make, put my own salad together when I was about 12. Yeah. But Good you did describe that she was a very caring, loving, fun person when she was well. And obviously, even when she wasn't well, she was trying to fulfill those responsibilities. But you also describe in your witness statement how important it was to have your weekends and support with your nan and pop. Um, and that, I presume, did that give you a bit of a break from your caring role when you do those visits to your grandparents? Yeah, so, you know, my family structure was incredibly small. 
basically my uncles were off on the mainland keeping out of it and there was just mum and I, no dad on the scene. There's just Nan and Pop, um, bless them. We go over to Wynyard every week, most weekends. No matter how bad mum was, they would always accept us in. And, you know, Nan was a big personality and a real driving force in my life. And she was just big on the advice and just, her and I became this sort of team and Pop was a fantastic dude, World War II veteran, but he was a bit sort of, he was a bit, a bit tired uh, to sort of do very much. And but Nan and I would sit on the swing seat, you know, I'm like 12 and we're having these team meetings about what to do about mum. Mm. Nan would be telling me that I'm a man now, um, from age 12, a lot. So, and, uh, that, you know, my job is to check check whether mum's taken her tablets because mm. we didn't have much of an understanding about mental illness or any of it. It was just, mum is sick. Why is mum sick? Is mum taking her tablets? We just think the tablets are the key to the equation. Yes. And, um, so Nan was really playing into that hypervigilance and, uh, you know, at a time that I sort of needed maybe, oh, I don't know, protecting or asking if I was all right, I just sort of got given orders, like a little, good yeah. little child soldier I was. And of course, I loved my family to death. And I would have done any, I did do anything for them. So yes. I just yes. saw it as like, here's a good opportunity to, um, to make Nan proud and do well at school and yes. maybe beat mum's mental illness somehow. And I think you do convey um, very well the, the sense that you and your nan were together trying to plan how to help your mum and help her manage her illness and, as you just said, make her well again. Um, but you did talk about the fact that you got to the point where um, there was a need to get a message to your mum's doctor and have a discussion with her GP, um, but you said you'd never really mentioned your mum and the challenges at home to anybody. You hadn't talked to anyone before this. So can you describe a bit what happened then and how you responded to the fact you thought you needed to talk to someone else about it? It was very frustrating because mum would be terrible at home. She'd be doing her crying and she'd do this teeth grinding thing and this threat style swearing thing which is so incredibly upsetting for me. And I just wanted it all to stop. And it just kept recurring. And so I'd go with mum to her doctor's appointments and sit in the waiting room while she went in and really want to go in there and go, hey, hey doctor, like mum's terrible at the moment. What are you going to do about it? And so I wouldn't be able to go in. So mum, Nan and I totally knew that mum wasn't really telling her much. She was pretty crafty about hiding her mental illness. And she um, would just say, oh, I've been having headaches, haven't been sleeping that well. And she'd come out all vague and just say, yeah, said I could take some Panamax. And I had this, I was very frustrated because I had a sense of the injustice of mm. one person who could maybe help us wasn't getting the story. So Nan and I's big central mission plan was for me to go to mum's doctor separately and tell her what was really going on. Mm. And so I was pretty nervous and shy about the whole thing and worked my way up to it and jaunted off at maybe about 13 or 14. And um, it went terribly. She just sort of listened and went, oh, yeah, hmm, yes, right. And then she mentioned something about doctor-patient confidentiality and dismissed me. And that was literally it. Yes. And I gather then, so you were never, no one up until that point had ever asked you how you were coping with mum's mental illness, how you were coping at home, what impact was it having on you, nor did anyone talk to you about mum's mental illness other than your family and how, what that meant for her and for you. So um, I think there was... Absolutely no one asked me how I was, not once, and that's in my entire life, that's as a grown-up as well. Um, the closest my family might go is saying, I know this must be hard on you, Justin. Yes. I think that was the, that's the closest they got. But then it was just, I know it must be hard on you, but here's some more orders. 
And what about your school? I guess you talked about the fact that GP wasn't able to help you at that time. What about, was your school aware that mum had some issues? I know she was very good when she was good. She was obviously very involved at school, but did anyone at the school ever think that there was something important to talk about with you and how it was impacting you? No, not at all. Absolutely not. It was just normal, normal family world and me being a happy little kid. And uh, I just, I, I never went off. I was just well behaved. Mum was mother's help till grade five, I think. And there's never any incidents mm. anywhere for anyone to know anything was happening. And um, we sort of had an incredible, like mum was sort of part of the flying under the radar and mm. keeping the secret. Like mum was as good at it as I was. We were both sort of expert at keeping this like very severe psychotic illness. Um, a secret, even though the neighbours probably would have been able to hear mum do her loud wailing, crying at night, and her neighbour Barbara absolutely knew what was happening and that mum would keep getting sick. But, um, you know, it was just a, a culture of no one likes to interfere too much in anyone's lives. No one really would know what to do anyway, even if they wanted to say, Are you all right? So, um, yeah, there was a it's just a, an amazing exercise in um, sort of we'll just, we'll just let this all go through to the keeper, shall we? Because we need to just keep the status quo, which the 90s in Tasmania was, I guess, was kind of obsessed with keeping the status quo. And so was our family. And the stigma of mum's mental illness was very buried. Yes. Under the, and so I was even I definitely delivered the message that we don't really tell anyone about this because it's extremely weird and upsetting. So this is our private family matter. Yes. And so did it, I bet you you know when your mum was really unwell, she was paranoid, she was delusional. So very severe symptoms of significant mental illness. But did anyone explain to you about that and what that meant? Um, or was that just something you came to understand yourself about what was mum's reality at that point in time and just how sick she was? No, I had zero education. I had not even a single day at school, no, not, not even a pamphlet. Nan was sort of in denial about what schizophrenia even was and sort of maybe would just, that word never got used till I was about 20. And um, I think Nan just saw it as severe depression. And it was, um, yeah, I saw a TV show once where the, a kid was getting sat down and he, I think it was the movie The, the Descendants. There's yeah. a scene right at the end where the, someone, family member's about to pass away and a girl's getting sat down and the adult is like explaining to them something. I remember just crying when I saw that. <laughs> Certain things get me that I'm like, oh, that's right. That's what adults do for children. They like sit them down and, and and explain when traumatic things happen. And I just because uh, my world, my my life, I've sort of gaslighted so much. I was sort of told everything was fine, even though it clearly wasn't. So I'm still updating my reality to like the real world with responsible, healthy, normal adults and yes. getting an idea of. I've had to like reverse engineer my life and work out the things that I didn't have that I should have, but I didn't even know they weren't there. Yes, and I guess we'll come to that because I, you know, your journey through your 20s, but there was just one thing where you talked about sometimes the loneliness of that reality of you living, mum being on the couch when she wasn't well and you know a bit where you got to your thing about mum get up um you know that whole thing but you did say at times it was incredibly lonely for you to be in that environment and um you did talk about that one of the loneliest days of your life was spent on a blustery sunday when mum flaked out on the couch listening to the same record on repeat and so it was very that was very telling that there was um, for you, it must have been an incredibly lonely period at times as a young carer. Yeah, it's not a competition or anything, but if it was, I would kick ass at the Loneliness Olympics. I would take anyone on, like, my levels of... a bit ironic to hear this talk of isolation yes. now. 
I'm getting reduced down to three letters because it's so funky and people don't have time to use the full wording. When like I was not only an only child, like at home, my my only parent member would disappear on me into her mental illness. And so I'm essentially in a house by myself. It's like a child living in a unit by yeah. themselves and just going to school. And uh, I just think that's, it was just, it's so extreme. I was sort of living on a desert island in a way and I had to come up with my own little just ways to fill in the time and entertain myself. And um, yeah. So I got when I was, went to the mainland one time yeah. and it was just mum and I, but I used to, my childhood hobby was covertly recording my family on a cassette recorder. Yes, I saw that. It was a pretty amazing little um, activity I came up with, which was a sort of way of, I sort of captured memories the way kids captured butterflies. And so I'd, I could rewind these tapes and listen to them and enjoy the caravan trip from last summer with Nan and Nan going on about the mozzies and Pop's voice and my uncles were there and me just like chatting away like across between Bart Simpson and Daryl Summers from AA hey, hey, Saturday kind of hosting a show. Um, so I came up with that as my, that was my, you know, my sort of time traveling toy yeah. and uh, sort of an imaginary friend, which I certainly, lent on to um I think I had to remove myself from the trauma of the reality I was in somehow and once you start recording you're sort of not quite in the moment you're half somewhere else so I think I came up with a little workaround. You also said though by the time you're a teenager you started getting angry so you know you you had been um, the times when your mum was unwell she was very angry and physically violent and aggressive towards others not to you um, and but you then got angry in return and you said you felt guilty about being angry but you did as a teenager in that volatile years uh, of development that was when you too started to feel pretty angry about your circumstances so um, do you want to just talk a little bit about that and then we'll go on to your 20s and what you started to do? Oh uh, yeah, I was, um, I was very furious at the world in general for letting this happen to me and let's be frank, uh, I'd, I'd like to say oh now I'm, I've gotten over that, I'm a well balanced grown up, <laughs> but yeah, who are we kidding? Yeah. I don't think that level of nuclear crankiness quite goes away because it's just a 12 year old in you basically look staring up and down at the empty street full of homes with smoke coming out of the chimney and I have to leave the house because mum's swearing so loud and I'm just like I'll never forgive you for this universe just letting you know this is like what did I do like I'm this awesome person I'm amazing I'm so clever and funny and smart and I have so much to give and um, why are you doing this to me relentlessly day after day? Yeah, so by the time I'm 15 and 16, I'm just slamming a lot of doors. And um, the book's called Get Up Mum Without a Comma for a reason. And for a while there, the editor people are like, shouldn't it be Get Up Comma Mum? And I'm like, you don't understand that an angry teenager pleading for their mum to get off the bed um, for like the millionth time, for like the sixth year in a row. It uh, doesn't have correct grammar at that point. Um, <laughs> I spent a lot of my teenage years at mum's bedroom door saying, mum, get up. Mm. And she'd say, five more minutes yeah. and I'll be right dear after a sleep, I promise. And so I've heard the words, I'll be fine from my mum quite literally my entire life and I've spent most of the time saying, Mum, you're not well at the moment, you're sick, you better go back to your doctor. Um, so I was losing control of my anger more and more as I approached 18 and once you start dropping the F-bomb at home, <laughs> that's mm. a problem. And I was Christian at the time, I became Christian when I was 13 and I saw myself one way and I was actually trying not to swear as just a thing that I wanted to do in life. Um, 
So I was really losing control. I, I had to I had to blow off steam somewhere. And mum's, I can't, you know, mum's teeth grinding is such a strange, bizarre concept that I can't really, people who read the book don't quite get it. And I tried to make a radio series of the show for ABC and they removed the noises that I tried to create because they're like, no one will get this. So it's a little bit like, the mum would like crack her teeth here through intense, she'd clench her jaw so hard that there'd be a cracking noise here that would. Yes, I could, I, I thought that was very powerful the way you described the grinding and the physical impact that it was so strong that she would crack her teeth. So it was. Like little bird bones breaking. Mm, and yeah. um, I don't know what people think when they think schizophrenia, I mean, you know, maybe you think the crazy person on the bus is talking to themselves. Like, that can also just be your own mum in the kitchen, sort of staring at the chops that are cooking and swearing at them. And, and while you're in a beanbag trying to watch TV, uh, I actually said this, I was trying to explain this to someone, and I said, if, if the illness was just mum on the bed being depressed and a bit sad, I think I could have handled it. Like I could have taken that honestly, and sometimes she laughed to herself, and that was kind of okay. Uh, but the teeth grinding and the swearing is one of the reasons that my nervous system's kind of so shattered today because it just fired little missiles into my stress center, into my yes. stomach. Yes. Every single time it happened, and it never got easier, and I never got used to it, and so I was just um. Oh man, you don't want to be over dramatic or whatever, but it's just I was just sort of just emotionally tortured. Uh, yeah, yeah. Literally was. Um by my own mum. Yeah. I, can, I don't know if you can imagine the kind of the heartbreak and the confusion mm. that causes is just this sort of crazy box that just keeps disintegrating and disintegrating and splitting off into two and that splits off into two and I'm I don't know what you do with this cloud of debris and shrapnel and um, yeah. confusion and uh, anger and sadness and I don't know. Life doesn't really provide a convenient space with which to um, sort of share that or place it somewhere. <laughs> and I think we might, we'll come back to what could you do for other children in these circumstances because it's so poignant I think Justin that you talk about what you went through and the impact that you had but without any um, support other than the personal support obviously of your family and your mum but that whole thing of um, what you had to deal with and then the residual emotional scars and impact that that's left um, but you then go in your journey and you talk about the fact that you then left home. I mean, the amazing thing was you also have a journey where you were a high achiever um, and able to complete your schooling and do well. And, you know, finally, you do exceedingly well as a young student and made the decision to leave home at 18. That must have been an amazing decision for you to make, to move to the mainland and leave your mum. Yeah. I don't know, how do you escape the island, you know, in a in a dinghy? You're not really supposed to leave Tasmania. It's a little bit of a cult. And, um, you know, you're not, you're not encouraged to leave. It's all about, you know, why would you want to leave Tasmania? Everything you want here. Good old Tassie. No one ever suggested I could do uni in any other, you know, state. Or, um, it's actually, I don't quite understand how I managed to do it, but a teacher's just suggested I go to the career advisor's room and look at some pamphlets and I wanted to be a creative writer and I had an uncle in Canberra and I saw a pamphlet for the University of Canberra and it was just that sort of age where you're pinballing all over the place and you're not you're just flying by the seat of your pants and you're just like oh yeah I, all right I'll do this then and I just made a decision and never looked at any other unis never researched a thing had no gap year. I was just like, okay, worked it out, going to Canberra, bye. Yes. And I just went. But yeah, I look back on it now and I think, you know, subconsciously or whatever, I absolutely needed to get away. 
Yes. So I just, whatever, the life force within me made it so. And mm. um, I guess it's been operating like that ever since. And I sort of ran 900 kilometers an hour into a kind of comedy and music career and being on stage going wild and having people cheer me and being very strange and connecting people over the radio and I guess I've been offsetting the extreme Olympic level of loneliness and isolation with um I just couldn't get enough of being in front of people mm. which would make sense I think Mm. And that comedian and joy of humour and the like, and I'll come for that, but you make two points before we get when you were talking about when you moved to the Badland and living here. Um, two things that stuck out for me. One was um, your first experience of being depressed and being, you know, the experiences you've had impacting your life um, even more profoundly in your own mental health. But before I get to that, you also talked about how and you made another few points in your statement about always the important family occasions mum would get sick, so at Christmas or when family would be visiting or you talked about on your 21st birthday, so when you're about to have a celebration in Canberra of your 21st birthday, it was another um, challenging time. So that must have been very difficult when these big memorable occasions would come and you'd also... Um, at times you couldn't enjoy them, obviously, to quite the extent you'd anticipated. So that 21st must have been very difficult for you. Yeah, the theme of disappointment is just so strong. It's just not a year goes by where you're not extremely disappointed because mum's gotten sick again. And I don't know, I don't even know if it got easier or you got more used to it or you like yeah. developed these tools. I don't think really that was the case. You just got older and, um, and um, you know, you, even my 21st, often, yeah, birthdays and Christmases. Mm. The, like, I understand way more now what happened to mum than I did then, but I think the pressure of these big occasions would just, wouldn't take much to, she'd want to make my birthday amazing because she's an amazing mum and loves me so much and, you know, your only son's 21st, she would mm. want to go to way too much trouble. But then that, she sort of, yeah, work herself back into an illness that way. And yeah, I, I hit the wall big time second year uni and had my first proper, felt like the bottom had dropped out of my life when I was in Canberra and um, I did most of it in secret and in private. And I was just an expert hiding anything from anyone and sort of acting and playing the character of my happy-go-lucky self. Yes. So I was sort of acting on stage at the time in the theatre production and acting as myself off stage as someone not massively depressed. But, yeah, still um, my ability to do that is sort of just frighteningly good and I really would happily go under all radars and I don't think people are looking that hard to see if you're all right well they certainly weren't then and even if they detect that maybe you aren't okay they're not in that much of a desperate hurry to you know get involved in all that so you can actually get away with heaps being a secretly depressed yeah. person in Australia especially as a bloke I don't know and you, but I think it is very, you, you make the point that it was around that stage that your mum had her first hospital admission in 20 years. And so, you know, for um, obviously she, between you and the care that she received and her own resilience, she'd done incredibly well not to have to be hospitalised before that. But you also said it took until you were about 28 before you ever saw someone for yourself professionally. And I, you mentioned the fact that you, finally went to see a psychologist that must have been you know you've managed all of this so privately for so long and with that very air of great success and being a comedian and an artist and a writer um so but you finally reconciled you needed to go and see someone that must have been a big moment for you yeah you sort of tell your story to someone and say oh, i didn't see i haven't seen a counsellor until i was 28 and they kind of gasped and I'm like, oh yeah, it's just another thing. It's sort of 
slightly difficult to believe in my mm. extreme life. Um, your mum was terrible on my 21st and she was really aggro at Nan and Pop and on the phone. They'd rang me up and were like, I'd be listening to mum going aggro at Nan and Pop. And when I was a kid, I'd have to hold mum back from attacking Nan. So you can imagine how stressful it would be to um, not be there in person and mum having one of her episodes. Mm. That happened a couple of times while I was in Canberra. And then they just escalated and mum held a knife up to Pop's throat. And um, it's quite un it was quite strange because most of her, she never went for Pop. She was always angry at Nan. And mm -hmm. so but, um, she, had, she went out onto the street and Nan and Pop had to ring the police. And this sort of thing never happened before. And this was when I was 22, and it was maybe the like the day after I had my first song on my Triple J national radio segment, as the bedroom philosopher. So it's all very dramatic. And um, yeah, Mum spent a week in the psychiatric unit, and they finally changed her tablets. And like, you know, what, she'd been on Malarol for like 25 years, and they moved her onto a new one. And um, I don't know, it's just by the time I went back home and she was kind of a different person and she was like she'd aged for 20 years and started going to bed really early and sort of behaving like an old lady and mirroring a lot of Nan's habits and um, yeah, there's sort of a lot to get your head around but the mum I knew as the good mum, like my mum as well, she actually disappeared around that time, like she kind of died and turned into this new version of mum. And I I think it took me 10 years to get my head around. Mm. Uh, oh, mum's different now. And yes. so, I mean, you, know, you don't get to say goodbye to a previous mum. Yes, I read that in your statement. It was incredibly well worded the way you explained that experience. But it obviously was then the time, you know, and you talk about then the next 10 years or so of your life, you were incredibly, um, you said you were a workaholic, you were very determined to be successful at your career and the things that you were pursuing um, and that you were working incredibly hard um, over that time. But you were seeing the psychologist and you said, I love counselling. You used the word to say that it was, um, it allowed you to process some of those haunting vault of confusion and trauma. And I guess, you know, reconciling that you'd had a very traumatic past. That was a very traumatic time for you as a child and framing it in a trauma framework um, and understanding the healing that needed to be associated with that must have been a very powerful time for you. It's funny the because I had this double life of like you know secret sad at home Justin and then super comedy awesome dude president of the SRC uh, everyone loves you know it's called Fonz at school and bedroom philosopher I've always had these nicknames and I'm like this sort of cool dude funny guy but then you know girlfriends would be having drinks with me and then I'd get really dark and moody maybe start crying and talk and kind of go, oh, my family is just all the pain of my family is like this poison in me. And then I think I was 28 and having an episode like that. And so the, the moodiness within me would always catch up with me and come out one way or another. And I don't know, girls like telling me how negative I was, mm. like it was this sort of problem I had that I should do something about. And, um, you know, that's, yeah, not a great message to get to someone who's kind of in trauma and needing a lot of support. But I was like, oh yeah, my negativity is awful and everyone hates it. So I'll hide it a lot uh, and keep yeah. going and being hilarious. But uh, by 28, I suppose I finally marched off to a, to a psychologist. And um, on the first session, he's sort of going, oh, you must have been very anxious and uptight as a child. I nearly cried right there, just going, oh, my God, it's the best thing anyone's ever said. Yeah. Uh, my childhood hadn't been acknowledged yeah. at all, to be honest, because my family by that point were erasing most of it and mm. um, just going, oh, yeah, we had a few ups and downs, didn't we? But we, we, all, we all soldiered on. Yeah. And that's the sort of... But meanwhile, my psychologist was saying stuff like, 
one day you're going to realise how painful your childhood really was. Yeah. Um, that's a yeah, that's a classic line to get for a 28 year old uh, mm -hmm. man. But um, I, had, uh, I had like sort of 10 years worth of stuff to start talking about at that point, so it was really good that I started and. Um, yeah, that was compulsory at that point. I absolutely had to start doing that um, because I wasn't functioning and I was sort of aware of my own ability to go down really hard and it's always been a secret fear of mine. Yes. I, don't, I don't really want to get clinically depressed and medicated and mm. have to go to hospital. So I, I kind of worked really hard to avoid that. And I think you made a point really strongly. You said a lifetime spent in fight or flight mode had ravaged my nervous system. It was now in a st fixed state of panic. And I thought that was um, very much like a lot of people have described to us what it's like when you're always in that state of hypervigilance and in that working between those emotional reactions. And you said that was really when you realised that you started to write your book. So you also found that an important release was to begin writing a book about your childhood as well as seeing your counsellor. And that helped you to reposition that you'd actually experienced a lot of neglect in terms of that childhood with a community of adults who knew what was going on and failed to protect you. So that must have been a very big realisation and the outlet of your book was obviously very important in helping you to understand that. The five years between seeing a counsellor for the first time at 28 and having a nervous breakdown at 33, uh, I just went so hard at the bedroom philosopher. I actually had my most success as a musician and comedian. Yeah. yeah. I had a song on Triple J that was a bit of a hit and I was just I don't think anyone's gone harder at an independent music career as I just doing 80, 90 gigs a year and did like four years in a row without taking any breaks or holidays and loaded up two credit cards. And I was just living life without the safety controls on, um, which is how I've lived most of my life. And I, I honestly, I was just running... I just wanted something to break at that point, I think, because I had no idea how you just stop and take time out and and, and reflect or repair. I only knew mm. the manic sort of going 900 k's an hour forward. And um, yeah, I just, I found out, I wanted to find out in a way, like what happens if you break your life and you hit the walls so hard that you just, you know, I just ran out of energy and I kind of had this chronic fatigue crossed with the hangover thing. And, yeah. stabbing pain in my stomach and my digestion went and I lost 10 kilograms and it was wild stuff and uh from like yeah 33 into 34 to 35 I was just went to ground and I was like oh yeah we're really not well <laughs> so, yeah. you know, that's right I'm incredibly unwell and filled with melancholy and mm -hmm. I've used up all my energy and yeah, fascinating time to be a public figure doing comedy gigs. But um, apologies to my audience and ex-girlfriends and whatever. But I hopped into the book at that point and um, started seeing a new psychologist who just, I think on her first session, she heard, the, she heard the whole story again and but asked something my previous psychologist never really did, which was like, so why didn't you go and live with your nan and pop? Mm -hmm. And... Um, it was great. She said, oh, the, I remember the moment I asked you that and you just sat there and your jaw kind of dropped and it was like, I don't know, it was one of the moments in my life where someone's genuinely blindsided me with something and yeah. um, got me out of my own head and I was like, oh yeah, hang on, how, can, how why have I never thought about this in 34 years? And there's been this five year mission of sort of turning my childhood on it upside down and looking at it from this entirely different perspective of want of better words I was sort of brainwashed by my family that they did a pretty good job of looking after me and that I'm a pretty good dude and that everything's pretty good but um, actually it absolutely isn't and I was neglected by the adults in my supervision the whole time mostly and you know when I was 12 I'd ring up Nan and Pop 
crying and say, can you come and get me? Mum won't stop crying. And uh, like they didn't come. They lived 20 minutes drive away. And so when I was writing the book, sure, I had a lot of cassettes and a lot of schoolwork and a lot of memorabilia to fill in a lot of the pieces. I even had a grade seven diary. Um, but certainly no recordings of the Nan and Pop please come and get me moment. So I, had to, I was lying in bed, sort of writing it by hand and really sort of going deep and extracting this poison through the black ink of the pen. And uh, it's an amazing moment for me because, you know, my Nan's one of those people who's always in control and never wrong and mm. never challenged. And uh, she's sort of, mm. in that moment, I I had to reinvent her for myself. And um, I guess writing my family out as characters sort of helped reset them a bit. And mm. uh, I'm still telling it from a 12 year old's perspective, but mm. it was from my point of view and it was, not not holding anything back and and you said that when you finished that book which was obviously that you know it was all part of working on your own mental health and making sure you were managing that but you said the reaction to the book was overwhelmingly positive you had including in your community in bernie and um you then started to get involved with some other organizations supporting carers so it was obviously a a very important process for you to work through but your book obviously hit a chord with many many people um in terms of the response that you had had to it yeah I, my publisher were very patient with me and i thank them for that because i was i thought it was impossible what i was trying to do and i didn't, wasn't even sure i was going to finish it and i desperately wanted to capture the voice of my 12 year old self and just write about one year in my life and um I just threw everything I had at it. And, um, and so when it came out and I had this sort of mock church service in honor of my 12 year old self in Melbourne and these sort of carer groups from like satellite and who work with children with parents of a mental illness sort of, you know, bound it up afterwards at the book signing and introduced themselves and it was like this I don't know, it was kind of an amazing um, reverse engineering yeah. of my childhood. And it's still, you know, 12 year old me was sort of happy to meet these people and imagine how much I would have loved to go to one of their programs or camps yeah. when I was that age. And yeah. yeah, I've been on this journey, I guess, the last two years of identifying as a child carer. Yeah. And I hadn't even heard those words in my life until I brought the book out. And then meeting quite a lot of other people who have had similar experiences. And yeah, I can't get enough of that. I mean, I'm just so um, so overdue for this kind of... Recognition. Yeah, it, it recognition's good and um, certainly feels pretty wild though, being on ABC radio, talking mm -hmm. about your mum's schizophrenia when you spent most of your life working very hard to keep it the world's best kept secret. So. Yeah. But I think it's that you talked about the fact you've been doing workshops um, with child carers and a whole range of other people. So you've also, whilst that, you know, you have turned on your head this family secret that you'd had for such a long time and now by publicly exposing it, but also publicly exposing your journey and experiences is very healing for other people to read as well and associate with a bit like you're saying. And in your witness state, you, you go on to have some reflections about what could be done to improve circumstances for carers such as yourself. And are you happy if we talk a little bit about what some of them are? Because I found them incredibly helpful for my own thinking. Uh, you know, you, you make the point about how it was inconceivable in your mind that you could have reached out for help for example, with a GP or others and not had the response. So clearly you think there's something very important about encouraging help seeking and acknowledging the personal toll on children as carers. Can you just talk a little bit about that and 
um, some of the other things that I've come to about what you think could be done to improve in the future? Oh, yeah, sure. Just a quick point to make about the book is that that's the beauty of art. Like, art is the gift Thanks. that keeps giving. And don't forget to support the arts in all this and arts role in uh, helping with mental health and telling stories like this. And for a syndrome which is ultimately made up of disorganised thoughts and chaos, I think writing is the exercise of organising one's thoughts and organising one's life into neat little compartments. And that's why I think the two are so well suited to sort of help each other out. Um, yeah. I was I doing a workshop yeah. presentation and this sort of 13-year-old kid saw the title and he's like, oh, yeah, get up, mum. That's what I say at home. Yeah. And in that moment, it was like, that was just genius. I, was just, I felt like maybe it was all worthwhile if I was, you know, a little bit unsure about what I was doing at that point. And only took a couple of kids to react to the book. Where I was like, oh, man, this is a miracle of time and space. You know, I was just this lonely kid in Bernie, Tasmania, with the world like a whole ocean apart from me. And now sort of connecting with this kid. Uh, so yeah, I mean, as far as the little bit I've had to do from the policy end of organisations that maybe work with schools and governments and they're trying to come up with this and that and how do we help the kids out. Um, I, I sort of get this gist of like school psychologists are sitting over, it's like a dance floor and the school psychologists are sitting on one side and the kids are on the other and no one really knows how to make them pair up. Yeah. Uh, like, I guess all I'll say is that you, you need to realise that kids aren't going to make the first move here. And that if you've got a policy that's waiting for kids to put their hands up and go, well, as soon as the kid asks for help, then we're there for them. But if they don't, then I'm afraid there's nothing we can do. I just think that's total crap. And you've got to know that teenage boys will not let you know anything's happening. And um, you need to march into classrooms and get some kind of literally a pamphlet under a kid on a kid's desk that says hey is everything all right at home because if yeah. it's not you should totally talk to this person yeah. and i would i'm no expert on what goes on in the policy end of anything but you need to be proactive and you need to get in front of kids faces with this stuff and um mm -hmm. you know you don't need to be tiptoeing around too much worrying about upsetting anyone. I just think there needs to be a little bit less of uh, that and a little bit more of um, just grown-ups taking charge of the situation and being a bit courageous and you have a duty of care so don't be sitting around waiting for kids to help you do your job for you. You'd really be wanting to plan to make yourself known. Um, yeah and I think that was your suggestions around that are really helpful in terms of you know um, how do you seek out and support young children and young carers um, much more proactively obviously than ever happened in your experience and that's something we're clearly looking at. You also make um, I think important observation about what we need to do about the conversation around mental illness and um, how we talk about and create a narrative around mental illness and there was one thing that you said when you were talking about your psychologist and you said i've never had a doubt for a second how much my mum loves me i know how lucky that makes me it takes a lifetime to separate mum from her illness love is a constant mental illness is a storm and i thought that was um, very powerful a way in which you described that um, and I think you talk about the need to use creativity in the conversation about mental illness in addition to reaching out in schools, but you do talk about the role of the arts, the role of creativity, and perhaps helping us to have a different narrative about mental illness. Can you just talk a little bit about that and also why you think humour is so important to that? Yeah, so the first point about when the radio series came out, I got an email from a guy in WA and he's like, you know, my mum has schizophrenia and I liked how you reminded people of the good times and how she's a great person and would be very thoughtful. And um, I just think if you want to raise awareness of schizophrenia, just humanising it as much as possible and rem rem reminding people that it is just 
you know, a woman on the couch, maybe giggling away at the wall. It's not this scary thing all the time. And um, yeah, with the book, I was really trying to humanize mm. mum and show her three dimensions as much as possible. And so people can associate that big 13 letter scary looking dead word schizophrenia with a lovely awesome person and um, it just be, could always be more of those associations made and I never quite understand why the mental mental illness and the arts don't sort of team up more they seem the most obvious pairing and in some ways they're kind of living in the fringes of Australian society and culture and we're not we certainly know our place um, we're sort of undervalued and off to the side and we don't get that much of the um, national debate or airtime or media awareness. Uh, and so, I don't know, I just, when I go online and look at the different organisations that exist or the awareness campaigns, it just seems like a lot of grim statistics to me and I stock photos of grey benches and there seems to be this idea that if you, you're going to offend people if you tried to make light of their mental illness or something, but that's just not right. Like everyone needs, everyone's got a sense of humour and people who have cracked often have the best sense of humour or the weirdest sense of humour. And um, there's a lot of seriousness and the problem with depression and anxiety and schizophrenia is that seriousness kind of reigns anyway. It's just, everything's very sombre already so for me personally I've um as an artist I'm just trying to flip things around and look at them from a different way and I've got a song called I think my cat's got depression and I try and look at all the different ways cats are like really indecisive at the door and maybe yeah. that's a split personality thing like cats are really anxious cats have hypervigilance you were talking about that before yeah. for me a cat is just an embodiment of mental illness um, it's like hyper vigilant, anxious, sleeps 20 hours a day, so it's probably got depression. Um, and look, this is just, I'm not trying to like be, I don't know, belittle or make fun of anything uh, for any like making offense. I'm just trying to, um, honestly, at this point, I feel like, what have you got to lose? Because I feel like mental health and mental illness is kind of just at the bottom of the ladder of. It just needs so much help in destigmatizing and continuing the conversation and getting people engaged. And mm. if you want to reach children or teenagers or teenage boys, like comedy is liquid gold in that yeah. area. And, you know, all these sort of corporate written websites, I don't know, honestly, don't know who they're for half the time because I'm like, who do you think is going to sit down and read that? Because maybe a lot of us are exhausted and tired and depressed. So uh, I just think energy and money could be pumped into yes. finding people from the artist community who, God knows, 90% of us have been through mental illness in one way or another. We're all, you know, you don't have to be crazy to work here, but it helps. Yeah. Uh, it's on our yeah. coffee mug. But uh, so, and not most of us are underemployed in Australia because that's just how it is. So, so I think I, I noticed, you know, you said that you thought that um, if you had this dedicated focus and got some of the people from the arts and social media strategists and us employed with the express purpose of raising awareness of mental illness and schizophrenia you mentioned. Um, yeah. And you also said it's the moment it's dry corporate information. And you said, imagine if the material, that you said that the material needs to be dazzling, intimate and original enough to excite people to engage with the subject that they are used to putting to one side. And so I thought that, you know, we are grappling with how do we deal with the stigma, the deprioritization of mental illness? What can we do to bring on this conversation in our forward agenda? And so I found that um, uh, really constructive suggestions and also your observation that, you know, you need a balance about lightness, playfulness and humour, but that that's a medium you can use that engages people. So I thought that was really uh, very important as were your ob other observations about, you know, what we can do reaching out to children and young carers and a carer register ways of providing support. But 
Justin, you've been incredibly generous with your time with me, but is there anything else, you know, thinking through or a final comment you might want to say about what we need to do to, given that this is a Royal Commission about the future, how can we improve, look to the lessons of the past, look to people's experiences and think about how can we design a system that will um, not allow as many children to go through the experiences it, with the lack of support that was available from the system for you. Um, and so I guess, is there any other final observation you would like to make? It's probably great timing to, people are sort of, they've just been isolated and lock, in lockdown and uh, there's this new appreciation for mental health and how you can't just take it for granted. So it's probably a great time to launch, I don't know, some sort of campaign of, uh, that can be more generalised and more aimed at mainstream society. Um, to keep it specific, I think schizophrenia gets a really hard time. I think it's kind of the black sheep of the mental illness spectrum and it's still this sort of, it's accepted to stigmatise against schizophrenia and it's sort of, no one's that bothered that it doesn't get any real, hasn't been given the same kind of light that anxiety or depression or, I don't know, autism, for example, affects one in a hundred people, which is the same ratio as schizophrenia. And I know a lot about autism because I hear about it a lot on the media. Yeah. But, um, so why do I never hear schizophrenia mentioned ever? Yeah. I think it feels like. So meanwhile, there are some really great documentaries out there, like The Sunny Boy is yes. one um, about schizophrenia. And I'm just like, the ABC had that themed TV week, Mental As, in 2013. And I thought that was such a great example of uh, like this, this sort of thing should happen every year, like one themed week a year in which it's it's across all media platforms. And imagine if you sort of, yeah, took the resources and um, material that was sort of involved in that week and then hit it at social media as well. And everyone loves memes right now. So what if you made like a hundred intelligent sort of mental illness related memes and just use them as a starting point to send some stuff out. And um, in terms of reaching kids, reaching kids in schools is the most important thing. I think you've just got to really think about how to get the message right in front of their face. And honestly, if I was 13 in grade seven and someone had come into our classroom and given us a questionnaire that said, does your mum have a mental illness? with a ticker box, I reckon I would have ticked yes. If that's the basic level of what doesn't exist right now that you want to exist, then I just say, do whatever you can to get a beaming, some sort of, yeah. just keeping kids on the radar, you know? Yeah, fantastic. So Justin, it was an incredible opportunity for me to have the chance to um, talk with you directly, um, having, um, initially, as I said, heard about your book, then had the opportunity to read your witness statement and now had the chance to speak to you on the Zoom. I hope when the state borders reopen, there might be an opportunity for us to meet face to face. But, I thought you just said skateboarders. No, well, they are <laughs> open now in Victoria, so you can Lockdown's go. Lockdown's over, so you send out this sort of group to skateboarding dudes just to skateboard all over the streets. <laughs> that is your creative mind compared to mine. <laughs> I watched too many, too many snack pack ads as a kid. <laughs> I'm focused on state borders reopening yeah. <laughs> opportunities um, to talk about face to face. But anyway, Justin, it was absolutely fabulous. And oh, thanks. Thanks for asking thank me. Thank you for the generosity of your time investing in the witness statement, the time with us today. And the incredibly constructive way that you approach what you thought might be ways to enhance the situation for the Justins of the future and now too, in terms of um, young carers and the absolutely fundamentally important role they play.